Good morning. Good morning. About to flip some lights on back there. <laughs> Ned, if you're listening, we miss you. Good to see everybody here this morning. Welcome. We have several are out today. Some people are traveling, a lot of things going on, but we are excited to be here. And for those who are watching online and listening, we thank you for being there as well. We love to study and to seek the the word of the Lord, to the knowledge of the Lord, just to understand who he is and to grow closer to him. And that's what we're doing. We're doing that every week. And I just praise God for that. This week, we're going to be in Malachi. That's the last book before the New Testament, just for those of you who don't know. And all of you know more than I know. You probably are already there thinking ahead. Our title this morning is Perfect Love. So, Father, we ask this morning that you reveal that perfect love in a way that we can understand it. There are many times, Lord, when we get into your word and we uh, in this relationship with you and we, we come to a place where we just don't understand some things. But the truth is, is that we have a faith in the one who is perfect, perfect love, perfect in all of your ways. And we, in our finite minds, when we don't understand something, we can come and be at peace because we know we serve the one who does. And that's what we stand upon. And so this morning, Lord, we just ask that you would speak to our hearts, guide our minds as we go through this, guide our hearts as we go through this, Lord. Let us put to bed and put to rest anything that's a distraction from this week, from the, from the morning, from whatever it might be. Let us be focused on you. And your word. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we did finish up 3 John last week. And in that, this epistle, and all the epistles that we studied with, with John, um, they were just a great study. I really enjoyed that study that we had in those epistles. And the two overall themes in these letters was abiding in the truth and loving one another. And we know that those two things come hand in hand with the two greatest commandments. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is defined by abiding in truth. If you're abiding in truth, you're loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you're not abiding in truth, you're not loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's just there's an absolute there. John 15, 4 through 5 told us, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, and he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Very important to understand this is what abiding is. When we're abiding in him, it's all about him. And when it's all about him, that means we are surrendered and loving him the way we should and to love your neighbor as yourself comes out of this same truth but as the verse we just read says without jesus we can do nothing in him however we can do all things in accordance to his will and his will is that we love one another and again that comes secondary the first love with jesus brings on the second love for one another can't get those mixed up can't put one ahead of the other otherwise it becomes about works and we know that we can't work our way into heaven by trying to do good things for other people. That's not going to do any good for anybody. It may help a, a person in a moment, but it's not going to save the soul, and it's not going to do you any good unless you're in relationship with Jesus Christ, and he's directing your steps. So, this week, we start a new study, and it's in Malachi, and I believe this study as our study in Isaiah is going to show a parallel of, of Israel's view toward God and the view of much of the church today. You know, we've been going through one, one thing when we started the book of Isaiah and went through that in, uh, up to chapter 50 and 51 as we're in it just finished up. We, we see this parallel. We see human nature. We see patterns of how God is directing people when they follow are blessed. When they're not, they bring curse upon themselves. And over and over and over, Israel would, would, would rise up in pride. God would bring them down. They would repent. He would restore. And then here we go again. The cycle. Well, here we are in a country today. And the church is supposed to be focused on Jesus, not the culture. 
And unfortunately now, now you can look at that differently. You can say, well, we are supposed to be about the culture. We're supposed to be the light in the culture. Absolutely. But what I mean we're focused on the culture is we're focused on it more than Jesus. We're looking to try to figure out ways to blend into the culture rather than having the culture changed by the light and the word of Jesus Christ. And there's been an off balance in that. And because of that, we've taken our eyes off of Jesus and the country is suffering for it. And the church is suffering for it. The country's suffering because the church has rolled over. And so now we're in a place where God is dealing with us. And a lot of people don't understand why, why, why. It's because of our own rebellion. And it's very similar. We see these, uh, these patterns. And we'll see that the same thing is going on here. So who was Malachi? Now we don't have a lot of information on him. But his name literally means my messenger. My messenger. Now, some say that this was just a generic writer, that that really wasn't his name. It was just a title of whoever this person was anonymous writing because he was the messenger of God. I don't really see that as as something that the scriptures support. There's no biblical support for that. And if you think of all the other prophets, they're all named. Why would he not name this one? So I believe it was a person named Malachi. He was named to be the messenger and what a message he has. He has a message of, uh, of where God is seeing them, how God is seeing them. And he's going to get into that as we go through this. Um, it is believed that he lived during the time of Nehemiah, around 397 B.C., possibly earlier. And Nehemiah concluded the historical books of the Old Testament where Malachi concluded the prophetic books of the Old Testament. This is the last book before Matthew. And you look at this and you say, well, uh, this is about 400 years before John the Baptist came on the scene. And Malachi is telling of his coming. We're going to see that as we go through this. Uh, Malachi 3.1 tells of the coming. Uh, Chapter 4 tells of the coming of the day of the Lord, which is his second coming. And it describes also the great tribulation. Now, This was written specifically to Israel. And it's like he is the last prophet to prophesy to them for 400 years until John the Baptist. Which is interesting that God spoke through Malachi and then was silent. He was silent for 400 years. And think about that for a minute. A lot of times today we're, we're frustrated if we don't feel like we've heard from God in a day. Or a month or a week or whatever. Or we've been dealing with the same issue over and over and over. And we've been praying and seeking and praying and seeking. And we're not, we're not hearing anything. Well, Israel went silent with their relationship with God for about 400 years. So this morning, we're going to dive in and we're going to see what God is saying to Israel through his messenger. So let's begin in Malachi chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. And we're going to stop right there for a minute. (laughs) And we're going we're gonna to do a historical lesson mainly this morning. I want to tell you that up front. A lot of our study is going to go back to Genesis. But, but I wanted to talk to you here just for a moment about the burden. The Hebrew word for burden is masah, which means an utterance, chiefly a doom or a prophecy. So right off the bat, Malachi has this burden, and this burden of the word of the Lord is to Israel. So Malachi, this messenger, is to utter this prophecy to Israel from the Lord. Now, there seems to be an intensity in his words when he uses this word burden. And I personally believe that the prophets in the Old Testament were burdened to speak what burned on their hearts to say. This is the way a prophet operated. God spoke through them. They didn't have much choice. I mean, if they were submitted and called as a prophet, they had to speak what was told to speak. They didn't have a choice. It's like... It's like this, I and mean, some of us have this problem in the flesh. We just, it comes in our head, we've got to put it out. That's not from the Lord. <laughs> but if it's from the Spirit, and we're listening in obedience, and He says, therefore say such and such, we need to be prepared, and if we're truly walking in the Lord, it's going to be beyond preparation. It's just going to be coming out. It's something that the Word has to do, because God has given it for us to say. Uh, these prophets were burdened to speak what God would say. Now, we know that the Holy Spirit 
didn't abide in them as he does in us today in the church. But he would come upon them. And this is something important. When a prophet was called, the Holy Spirit would come upon him to speak what he was told to speak. And there's many cases you can go through and read and where the, the Spirit came upon a prophet or a, a leader. In Numbers 11, 24 through 25, we read, So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tabernacle. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took of the spirit that was upon him and placed the same upon the 70 elders. And it happened when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, although they never did so again. Interesting thing when you bring that forward to the gifts, isn't it? And we have the Holy Spirit in us when the Holy Spirit decides to use by his, uh, for his uh, will in us. To glorify God, the gifts will be used, but it's him that does it, and you may never get that gift again. You may have it on a regular basis. That's between him and whatever he, and the Father and whatever the will of the will is of God for your life. But the point I'm making here is, is that in this case, when the Spirit came, they prophesied and it, when the Spirit came upon them. And the Spirit came upon the judges in Israel over and over. Go back and read through the judges. The Spirit came upon and raised up. And the Spirit used this person or this person as the Spirit came upon them. Uh, The one that comes to mind is Samson. The Spirit came upon Samson every time he was, you know, he was about to be captured. The Spirit came upon him and he was strengthened and he would rip the bondage, the the whatever ropes and everything. And he would take, one time he took the whole gate with him and and run up the hill with it. Um, It was the Spirit upon him that brought all this to be. The Spirit came upon Samuel. The Spirit came upon Saul. Saul prophesied when the Spirit came upon him. Spirit came upon David, and many more are listed in the history of Israel. So Malachi begins to speak this word, and the first thing that God says through him is, I have loved you, says the Lord. I have loved you, says the Lord. Now, this statement of truth is so powerful, and God leads off with it. He leads off with this. There's many things he's going to say. But this is his first statement. And I believe today if God's church took a moment and received these words that God loves you and really believed it, what a revival we would see. What a revival we would see. Because it is a personal thing. God loves you. God loves you as an individual. He loves you as the corporate body. He loves you so much that he wants you to be in relationship with him. And he provided the avenue for that to happen. He provided the way for us to be in this relationship with him. The problem today is that most of us, when we hear, I love you, we process that through our human ability to understand it and sometimes that takes us all the way back to our own parents or other people that were close to us and they said they loved us well okay well what if they what if they were imbalanced and they said they loved us but their actions were harsh how does then we how do then we interpret love when we feel like we say god loves us well god's a harsh man then god's a harsh god he's a he's an ogre he's mean He's, we were sitting around waiting for the shoe to drop and waiting for something to happen to us. That's how some people see God because that's how they saw parents or they saw other situations in their life. So, so when we see and hear that God loves us, to take that for what it means from God's perspective versus from how we want to interpret it in our own mindset, there's a vast difference. There's a vast difference. And this is why when we come to the Lord, we have to lay down all of these perceptions and way we perceive things, our emotions, all of these things. We have to lay them down and say, God, I want you to reveal to me what that means from your perspective and not let me get in the way of it because otherwise I'm going to have it tainted. And I'm not going to be able to receive and walk as close as I want to with you because I'm in the way of it. And this is what God wants us to understand. He wants us to not process love through human experience, but understand that a holy, perfect God means what he says and stands behind what he says and proves what he says through his actions. Now, I mentioned this before, and I hope that you don't take this the wrong way. I'm not beating 
this book up, but the book, The Five Love Languages, I brought this up one time before, and I'm really not trying to be critical because I do think there are some encouraging things you can pull from those things as far as really understanding and, and, and loving others through it. But the problem that we have when we get into these type of things is that each of these love languages are flawed. They're imbalanced. And so when we're, we're saying, well, I have this love language. I receive love by gifts. So if you don't give me things, I don't feel loved. Or I, I, I interpret love by verbal affirmation. So if you don't give me this verbal affirmation, I don't feel loved. I, I, I don't feel love unless the human touch. I need the touch. I need this. I need this. Hear the word. I, I, I. Need, need, need. Back to me, me, me. They're rooted in emotion, and they're also rooted in learned behavior. And so when we think of it from that perspective, when two people come together and each have a different way of interpreting how love is to be given or received, conflict arises, and neither party understands why the other doesn't love them the way they should or the way that they feel they need to be loved. And one might say that we, could, or we should identify the other's need and then meet that expectation willingly. In theory, that's good. Isn't that what putting others first is all about? But inevitably, it becomes one-sided. I think a better way to approach this is two people coming to the Lord and giving their fleshly expectations to Him. If you come to God and say, God, this is how I've always felt love, and I'm not getting it. I'm not feeling it. I'm not receiving it. I want to give this to you because if you're a perfect God and you give perfect love, then I want to receive your perfect love and let you love me the way that I know that I'm loved and then I don't have expectations. I can take the expectations off of other people. We're taking them off of others and we're letting him pour through both parties, not just one, a true and balanced way for he is the only source of perfect love. And again, the hard part about relationships is the expectations that we bring to the table based on baggage that we've had all of our life. We've been wounded. We've been hurt. We have expectations. And some of us say, well, I don't have expectations. Uh, well, yes, you do. You do. You may not think in your mind that you do, but I guarantee you the person that you may be in a relationship with knows you do. But it's both sides. And so we have to both come to the Lord, both lay these things. And, and this can only happen when two individuals are walking in the Lord. That's why the Bible says do not be unequally yoked. That's why the Bible says do not put yourself in a situation with an unbeliever, specifically in a relationship, because when you do that, you're coming and you're expecting something that you, the expectation from the Christians is, oh, well, they're going to see my light and they're going to get saved and then they're going to walk in the Lord. That's what you believe. The, the un, non-believer, ah, I'm just, I just love them and I'm just going to marry them. But the expectation there is, is don't push your God on me. And many times, the very situation that you desire when you, when you do enter a relationship, well, I love them so much, I know God's going to save them. Many times they will pull you away from God more than you will pull them to God. Because your love for them is out of balance. You didn't listen to God first. And this is, a, this is a situation that two people need to be in relationship with God before they enter in relationship with one another. So why not I go down this rabbit trail, you ask? Because in our text this morning, God tells Israel he loved them and they didn't receive it. They didn't understand his love. They had their own expectations of what they wanted from God. First, he gave them a pro the prophets. They didn't want the prophets anymore. They wanted a king. God knew that a king would not be good for them. God knew all their desires to, for them to feel special, for them to feel loved, for them to, that they wanted to dictate to God what they wanted from him rather than receiving what he had for them and walking in that. So God says right off the bat, I love you. But they couldn't understand it. They couldn't receive it. After all he'd done for them, they questioned his perfect love. So we'll continue in the, rest, uh, in the second part of verse 2 here. He said, yea, in what way 
have you loved us? So this is kind of how God is dealing through this, through this book. There's a statement made, and then God responds from the statement he just made, knowing the heart of Israel. Israel didn't say this, but God knows this is what they're thinking. And so he says, I have loved you, but then and he says, but you say, in what way have I loved you? In other words, he's seeing that God is not receiving their, his love to them. They don't understand it. They're confused. They wanted this, 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 and this. And how many times have we in our prayer life been angry with God because we prayed for something that we wanted and he said no? Well, you just don't love me, do you, God? You just don't love me. Now, we may not say that out loud, but that's what our thoughts were. When we were upset with God, we're basically saying we know better than him, and he didn't love us enough to do what we want, so therefore he must not love us at all. So this is kind of what he's saying here. He says, yet in what way have you loved us? And it goes on, was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now, that's interesting. I'm going to stop there for a second. I actually just added this in this morning. I, I meant to have it in here, and it just uh, it wasn't there. But the Hebrew word for hate is sonne. And it means, I mean, it means uh, an enemy or a foe. It means basically that you are not with me, you're against me. And that's what he says here when he says, Esau, I have hated. And you can look at this and you say, wait a minute, God hates? Yeah, he hates sin. We know that. And he lists several times several things I hate. You can go through and, and look that up, the things that God hates. But when he says he hates Esau, isn't that harsh? God hates Esau? When you look at this, and he's, God is looking at Esau as an enemy. He's looking at him as a foe. Why? Because of things that Esau had done? No, because of the heart that Esau had. Esau's heart was hardened to God all of his life. God knew that, and God knew Jacob's heart. Now, you can look at Jacob and say, well, he was a scoundrel. Yes, he was in the beginning, but God also knew his heart. Jacob, when he was broken, surrendered himself to God. Esau never repented and never had a heart for God. Esau was all about the moment. We'll get to that in a moment, but it says, it goes on in verse 3. But Esau I've hated and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of impoverished. Oh, I'm sorry, for the jackals of the wilderness. Even though Edom has said we have impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus says the Lord of hosts. They may build, but I will throw down. They shall be called the territory of the wickedness and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. So God answers the question that Israel has with a history lesson. Jacob and Esau, two brothers, born of Isaac and Rebekah. And these were ten, twin brothers. They were twin brothers in the womb. And from the beginning, from conception, there was trouble between them. And we're going to read, this is where we're going to get into some history here. And I'm bringing this all out because I want you to see the full picture of why God makes this statement. So Genesis 25, 21 through 28. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her. And she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. The people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So when her days were fulfilled to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red. <laughs> he was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brothers came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man, dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Again, we see now you're saying, okay, parents are already playing favorites. One loves one over the other. And think about it, from, from Isaac's sake, he loved, he loved Esau because he was a good hunter and brought back a lot of good food. So there was some 
self-centeredness in that and selfishness about what he was getting from his son. Rebecca, however, loved Jacob. Now, you can take that for a moment and say, yeah, God had already spoken to Rebecca about Jacob. He's already told her that the younger will serve the older. He's already answered what's going on in her womb. So she's going to lean toward Jacob probably more because of what God said than her own fleshly desire. But then again, he was a homebody. He was a mama's boy. And so there's a lot going on there too. We see throughout Scripture that even those chosen by God had family issues. They had problems. Human nature is always there. We're always dealing with this tent. That's why there, somebody said this morning, I think in the prayer time, there is no functional family. We're all dysfunctional. And that's a very true statement because we're still in this fleshly tent. If we all submitted to God and walked 100% with him, then our families would be perfect. But what does that tell us? It means that we don't always do that, do we? And we still carry a lot of consequences before the time that we have submitted to God. So there's a lot of stuff going on in our families. There, there's a lot of dysfunction there. So we see this conflict between brothers. And no doubt it was fed by the parents. Jacob, a mama's boy, and Esau was a daddy's boy. And Esau was the, was the oldest. He was physically stronger. He was an outdoorsman. And while Jacob may stay in, he was an indoors kind of a guy, he also liked to be in the kitchen a lot. Now, Isaac cooked the game that he would bring in, but Jacob, he would cook all the time. And he was doing stuff in the kitchen and doing different things. The oldest son was the one who was supposed to receive the blessing of the inheritance from his father. But Esau's heart was only for Esau. He wasn't thinking about the long term. He was thinking about the moment. We have to remember that God, uh, what God told Samuel in uh, 1 Samuel 16, 7, he said, But the Lord said, Do not look at his appearance. This is when he went to Jesse's house, and he was, he was told, You know, you will anoint the new king of Israel, because Saul, I've removed my anointing. And it was going to be David, but David wasn't in the house at the time, and all these were parading through. All these sons were parading through, and Samuel, it must be this one, must be that one. And God said, Don't look at the appearance or his physical nature or stature, because I've refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Taking that and placing it right here now on Esau, God's looking at the heart. He's looking at the heart of Esau. Now again, on the surface, Jacob was no better. His name meant supplanter or deceitful. That's what Jacob meant. The one who takes the heel. But God knew that once his heart was broken, his heart would be right, where Esau's heart would always be hardened against him. Because Esau was a self-centered, selfish person that would not look to anything else except what he wanted for the moment. Let's look more at their history. In Genesis 25, 29 through 34, now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I'm weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, Look, I'm about to die, so what is this birthright to me? He's about to die. He's a strong boy. He's out hunting all the time. This is nothing new. He wasn't about to die. He was extremely hungry. He wasn't starving to death. But he wanted some of that stew, and he wanted it now. Then Jacob said, Swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose, and went on his way. He's out of his mind. He's out of his head. All right, I'm hungry. I've been fed. Words don't matter. What I just did didn't matter. It's no big deal. I'm going about my business now. Thus Esau, though, despised his birthright. All over his fleshly desire to eat a bowl of stew in the heat of the moment. Now Esau gave up his inheritance. And I'm not sure again that he didn't take it all that serious because he knew that his father still loved him. He was his favorite. His father was the one that was going to give him the blessing, remember? So why not just, I don't care about my birthright. I'm going to get it anyway. 
you're not going to be able to take it from me. I mean, I'm just thinking in my mind what he might be thinking after he spoke those words out. They didn't really mean anything. My dad loves me. But I believe and know from history and reading that God saw it differently. Those words weren't just words. They were speaking from the heart. And out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So he spoke what was in his heart. It wasn't a casual thing. It revealed Esau's callousness. And it cost him dearly. Now let's look a little bit further. And this is where a lot of our reading comes. Genesis 27, 1 through 40. So hang on. Now it came to pass, when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see, that he called Esau his older son and said to him, My son, and he answered him, Here I am. Then he said, Behold, now I'm old. I do not know the day of my death. Now, therefore, please take your weapons and your quiver and your bow and go out to the field and hunt game for me. And make me savory food such as I love. And bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. This was his intention. He was going to give him the blessing before he died. Now, we don't know that from reading this, this was Isaac's mindset. that He didn't know when he was going to die. He may have been in that mindset, I... I ain't got much time left, you know. I'm, I'm uh, 89, 90, 120, whatever old he was. I, don't, I didn't do the study on his age. But, but I've seen it in my, own, in my own parents, you know, as they were getting older. There were times when they were pondering that a lot. I don't know how much more time I've got. And, I mean, I heard that for several years before the time actually came. But this is, this is what happens when you get older. You start thinking about these things. And, and Isaac was in this moment of wondering when he might be dying. But you know what? Before I die, I sure want some of that stew one more time. Some of that good food that you can go out and get. Bring me some of that stuff. Now, verse 5, Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it. So Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make savory food for me that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats, and I will make savory food from them for your father such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father that he may eat it and that he may bless you before his death. Dysfunctional family? Yeah. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I'm a smooth-skinned man. <laughs> I use an air. I just kind of take all this hair off. I'm aware some stare at my hair. In fact, to be fair, some really despair at my hair, but never mind, I'm not going with all that. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him, and I shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go get them for me. And he went and got them and brought them to his mother. And his mother made savory food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the choice clothes of her, older, her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats on his hands. Now talk, think about this for a moment. It says he was a hairy man. And this is a hairy man. If you're able to take goat skins and put on your hands and it feels like your son, boy, he was, he was hairy. He took the, the skins of the kids of the goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. Then she gave the savory food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. So he went to his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I'm Esau, your firstborn. I've done just as you told me. Please arise, sit, and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord your God brought it to me. <laughs> Digging a hole a little bit deeper. Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you're really my son Esau or not. And obviously, he, he, there was a, he, he knew something wasn't right. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother's Esau hands. So he blessed him. Then he said, Are you really my son Esau? And he said, I am. He said, Bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's game. 
so that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him, and he ate, and he brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his clothing, and blessed him and said, Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of the field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore may God give you of the dew of the heaven, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you, and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren, and let your mother's sons now or southern mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be those who bless you. Now it happened as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from his hunting. He also made savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that your soul may bless me. And his father Isaac said to him, Who are you? So he said, I'm your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, Who? Where's the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate of it all before you came, and I blessed him, and indeed he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me also, my father. All about me. All about me. But he said, Your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. No. He gave away his birthright, but he's blaming Jacob for that one. And now look, he's taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Then Isaac answered and said to Esau, Indeed, I had made him your master, and all his brethren I have given to him as servants. With grain and wine I have sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac, his, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be in the fatness of the earth and of the dew of the heaven from above. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. And it shall come to pass, when you become restless, that you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now, we can look at all of this, and we can see deceit, we can see manipulation. This is all the hand of, of men and women that are doing all this. But you also have to take a step back and you see that this was God's plan. Now, how do you reconcile those? How do you reconcile that God told her in the beginning this was going to happen? He allowed it to happen because he knew that Esau's, that Esau's heart was hardened against him. And he knew that Jacob's would be turned to him. Therefore, he loved Jacob and he hated Esau because Esau was his enemy. You have to reconcile it from the standpoint that God's a perfect God. And yes, he used imperfect situations to create an environment that his will would be done. And you can also say, well, he, did he really create? God didn't manipulate them to do these things. No, he didn't. But the stage was set. God's plan would be put into place. Whether it happened this way or any other way. Jacob was going to receive the blessing because God ordained it to be so. Now, how sad this whole story is. And one could have sympathy for Esau and even be angry with Jacob for what he did. But again, it's all part of God's plan, as he told Rebekah while she was carrying them in the womb. And God knows the heart. God knows the heart. And even though Esau was remorseful, he never repented. There was no repentance in his heart to God for the selfish and callousness and the words that he spoke and blaming Jacob for him stealing his birthright he just gave away. But now blaming Jacob also for stealing the blessing. But understand, God knows the heart. Hebrews 12, 14 through 10. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest by any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. 
lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for the morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. See, there's a difference between repentance and remorse. Remorse is your, is your, your repentant. You're, you're not repentant. Your remorse is the fact you got caught. And when you get caught, you have the emotion that comes with that. You're sorry and all of these things. And, it's, and that's real. But repentance, if it's not accompanied with that saying, you know what? Had I not been caught, my heart was not repent, didn't have any repentance. I was just going to continue on. And so we look at Saul, the same thing. Saul had no, rem he had remorse for many things that he did, not following completely God's rules and God's laws and God's words, but he never had repentance. He just, well, well oh, you're right, I should have, or, or, or I was afraid of the people. He had an excuse for everything. His heart was hardened. That's why God took his anointing and gave it to David. And here we see God took the blessing and gave it to Jacob. Because of the hardness of his heart. God knows the heart. And though he was remorseful, he wasn't repentant. Now here in our study this morning, God is giving this example of how he loved Jacob and hated Esau. As an example to Israel, this is how much I loved you. I chose Jacob, his line. I chose this to happen so you guys could actually be here today. Yeah, we have the Edomites, or had. <laughs> they, they blew it. His heart was still unrepentful all through there. And basically, you don't hear the Edomites anymore, do you? They're non-existent. But you hear of Israel. And God had chosen Jacob, even though he was a supplanter, though he was deceitful, he had to come to the end of himself. And that happens later on. In Genesis, which we're not going to get to this morning, but you can go back and read it. He, was re he, he did repent. And God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. And from that point on, he was called Israel. But see, here's the thing. I loved you, and I have the best for you. Because I chose to go through the one who had a repentant heart, not a hard heart. God chose the best for them, but they couldn't see it. Israel couldn't see the best that was set before them. He couldn't see what was, what, or Israel couldn't see as a nation how God loved them. And so when God tells them that he loves them, well, how have you loved us? It's, it's like a sarcastic response. Show me, you don't love us. How have you loved us? Well, this is how I've loved you. I chose the best for you. I gave you and made you who you are. And yet... You've not loved me back. You don't receive my love. You haven't received what I have for you. Now today, God shows us how much he loves us. He chose the best for us by sending Jesus. And Jesus is the seed that came from Abraham. Through Isaac. Through Jacob. He has the best for us. But how many times in the hardness of our hearts, how do you love us, God? I wouldn't be going through what I'm going through if you really love me. Why am I having this difficult time? Why am I going through this season? What, what's going on? And God says, behold, I have loved you. How have you loved me? I sent Jesus. I gave you the door. That restores you back to a relationship with me. This is what the Father's telling us. It's what he's telling the church. And the church needs to grab a hold of that. And get back to the roots of who we are in him. This is how much he loves us. He's a holy God. He's a righteous God. He knows the hearts of all people. He knows the hearts of all men. And while we can look at things and we can say. Well I don't understand why you're so harsh here. And why you're so not harsh here. I don't understand. God is a perfect, holy God. He is going to do what is best, even though we may, in our finite minds, think it's not so good when we don't understand it. 
there'll be a day when we'll see him face to face and we will understand the holiness and the fullness of his perfection. Right now, we have to take that in faith, knowing that everything that he does is right. And we need to accept that from him. He loves us that much. Jesus came to take our sin and our judgment upon himself. That's how much he loves us. But there's grumbling in the camp. Not our camp. <laughs> I don't hear you guys grumbling. But there's grumbling against God in the church today. If there weren't grumblings, we wouldn't be having church splits over biblical issues. But the grumblers have come and said, well, this isn't fair. If God is love, he should accept me in my sin. No, he loved you enough to give you a way away from your sin. You just don't want to take the love that he's given you. You want to walk in your own fleshly nature. That's not loving God. But it is God giving you an opportunity and loving you enough. And that enters the church through the front door and the church splits over it. Oh, that's not what that's not true. That's not what the Bible says. What my Bible says. God loves you enough to bring you to the place to expose your sin to you that you may repent from it. That's how much he loves you. Not accept your sin because he loves you. He can't do that. God is a holy God. He can't accept sin. He had to make atonement for it. And the atonement is Jesus. No other way. No other door. He is the atonement. But if you don't accept that you're a sinner, you can't receive his atonement. And it's not just the homosexuality. It's adultery. It's all of the sin that goes against God's word. Anything that goes against God's word is sin. And it's not just the fact that it's a written word. It's the knowing that God is a holy God and we're not. That we're born as sinners because of Adam's fall. Each one now that is conceived is conceived in sin. We are born in sin. And until we come to that conclusion and say I'm a sinner. No matter what I try to do or don't do. Whether I murder anybody or have an affair or, or get into this relationship. Whatever. You're still born a sinner. You still need Jesus. And he's the only avenue to the father but people would rather go to the social clubs and get a positive mental attitude speech so they don't have to deal with their sin that's grumbling in the camp some would say if God really loved me he would not fill in the blank if God were me then he would fill in the blank know this God is a holy, a righteous, a sovereign God. And his plan for us is given through a perfect and balanced love. But we're not going to understand that with this mindset. The world's way of fairness. The world's way of fairness is not fair at all. Because they believe that they can, that, that they can live any way they want. They can do anything they want. It's all about them. They can create their own God. They can create their own image to worship. They can do whatever they want to do. And they're accepted because that's fair. But God says, no, your idea of fairness does not line up, doesn't line up with a holy God. He is holy. He is righteous. He is what we are living up to his word and so therefore no matter what we do in the flesh we'll never never line up line up it only can come through jesus because jesus is the only one that did line up we need to receive it for what it is not for what we think it should be what we'd like it to be what we wish it to be but for who he is and his word Stands firm as absolute. We can stand upon his word and know these truths. Always remember. God knew Esau. And God knew Jacob. He knew their hearts. And he knows yours too. He knows mine. He knows all of those. Who are in the world. He knows the hearts. So he's not sending them to hell. For not receiving him. 
just as Jacob, saw, I mean, just as Esau sold his birthright for the moment of pleasure, he chose what he chose. God didn't make him do it. God didn't send him to hell. God didn't condemn him. But because of the attitude of his heart that he would not repent and not turn to God, God hated him because he became his enemy. This is how God views the world. God hates the world. He hates the sin in the world and the worldly mindset. But he loves the people enough in the world to give them a way out. And the church needs to come back to that truth and that foundation and stand upon that alone. Not stand upon let's get everybody in the door and make them all feel good. Not try to make a big, huge building. Not try to, to celebrate Hollywood or whatever they're doing down the road on some of these church signs that you pass. You know, big Hollywood signs and movie scenes and all this stuff. And one time I drove by and, and the, that same church had, let's talk about sex on the front building. Big, huge banner. No, you talk about it. I ain't coming to your church. I, I know what God says about sex. We don't need to bring the world in. It's, it's, it's an attention getter. It's, it's basically trying to, you know... Touch on the emotions and say, oh, man, we've got to check that out. Oh, I want to. Listen, we get into the word of God and let the Holy Spirit do the work through the word and through his ministry. That's all you need. Otherwise, you're just filling the doors with people out of curiosity. And you're not really getting to the core root because when you start getting to the core root, those same people will take off running as fast as they came in. They're running out. And I know many people who have been to some of these churches that have made this very statement. Oh, it was, you know, it was exciting. The, the music was great. And they turned down the lights, and it was like a big, I mean, a big uh, concert, and it was awesome. But after I went for a while, I just, I just didn't, there was nothing to sustain it. There was nothing there but show, lights, and smoke, and mirrors, and the whole thing. We have what sustains us. Let's lead off with that. I have loved you is how he led off with his message here. That's what we need to get back to. He loves us. He loves you. He loves those. He loves all men, but he wants them to turn to him. He loves them enough to give them away. We receive that way. May we be the light in the world and be standing firm on his word to be that same light. Because he does hate sin. And when it comes down to it, when that decision, that heart is that hard. Just as he wiped out nations because of the hardness of their hearts. God knows. And everything he does is perfect, even though we don't always understand it. It's a perfect love. And we know, too, that many times we have fears and anxieties and perfect love cast out all fear. We can walk in peace with the holy God even though we don't understand everything. Because that's who he is. Let's grab a hold of that. And let's hang on to it. And next week, we'll pick up where we left off and keep on going. Father, thank you.